there's a meme that's been going around of, and the, the, the idea that they're trying to capture is that someone who is extraordinarily rude and wants to see the manager instantly. And so if your name is Karen, I first of all apologize to you, I love you. This is nothing against you here personally. But the, but the meme is basically, don't be a Karen. Okay, so the, the characteristic of, this is so funny because there's actually a researcher, a lady who studies memes, but she, and she describes a Karen as the following, and I want you to think about the gospel as we hear this. She says that the characteristics of a Karen are entitlement, selfishness, and a downright desire to complain. A Karen demands that the world exist according to her standards with little regard for others, and she is willing to risk or demean others to achieve her ends. Karen sees no one as an individual. Instead of moving through the world prepared to fight faceless conglomerate or lesser than people who won't give her what she wants and feels she deserves, she wields her power. And yes, and that feeling of entitlement is what makes her undeniably a Karen. So if you've seen any of these memes, basically what they are is they'll find, they'll, they'll, they'll videotape somebody that's really, really like just ripping into somebody, you know? So it might be a lady at a supermarket that's grilling the manager or somebody at the restaurant that's, you know, yelling at the manager or demands to see the supervisor and then she just tears that person apart. Like she just can't wait to get to them. And then it's put up there on the internet for everybody to see and you can sometimes hear in the videos people actually say in the background like, hey Karen, how are you? You know, like while she's screaming. Well, I was with a friend a couple weeks ago and we were at a restaurant and she's, she is a, kind of a Karen. I love her dearly, but she's kind of a Karen. And, and this was happening at this moment. She, was, she asked to see the manager over something that happened. It was bad service. She asked to see the manager and she just lays into the manager, right? And I'm just sitting there because I'm a priest, right? And I'm just like, ah, what do I say? What do I do? I don't know. And um, as she's screaming, I realized that somebody took out their phone and was videotaping her. And, and then I got like a panicked feeling inside, like, what if this goes viral? You know, like, so I remember thinking like, should I go over there and stop this? Or should I, is it just gonna like be more scary if a, if a guy goes over there? So I'm kind of going back and forth, what should I do? And, and I'm just, I, I didn't know, I kind of froze, and I just watched the scene unfold before me. And it wasn't until after that we got done and we were walking away that I realized that she was being a Karen. And I thought, she was being a Karen and I didn't do anything. I just watched it happen and stood there. And, and it only got to me because I, I realized somebody was videotaping it. That's what made me like really realize what was going on, that this behavior that was happening wasn't appropriate. Nobody wants to be screamed and grilled out, right? I remember working at like McDonald's as a kid and people would just tear you apart for something over the drive through that you had no, it was like nothing that you did. Or I'd worked at a gas station and I, I found people after people were just like so mean. And you know, so I realized that it's my duty then to, to, do, to do something or to say something. And so I remember pulling my friend aside and, and saying to her, you know, um, you probably shouldn't have been like, and she didn't have a mask on either, so it was even worse. She was like right up in the face without a mask. And I'm like, do you realize that was being videotaped? And like, what if that went viral? You know, what would happen to you if that went viral? People would probably begin sending nasty emails or torching her house or who knows what would happen. But the reality is everything that we do is seen before God. Everything that we do is viral before God. God sees everything that we do. And so it's so important that when we catch ourselves or others, that we actually intervene or, or try to correct the person. And this is where I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the gospel. One of, the, um, one of the, the laws of our church, one of the commands of our church is to, um, to correct people. It's called fraternal correction. It's a long time tradition of our church that we are to correct our brothers and sisters. But that's tough, right? It's tough to do, like even in that moment it was tough for me, and especially if you really like that person, you're afraid if you say something they might get mad at you, and that's like e even worse. But, but Jesus says that we are supposed to do it. And we're not supposed to be a Karen either, which means we're not supposed to go directly to the manager. We're supposed to deal with the person right in front of us. And I, I love to review this gospel because I think that so often we forget about it, and it's just good for us to hear every once in a while. So firstly, if your brother sins against you, what's the first thing you do? 
you go to your brother, right? You don't go even to your spouse. You don't go to your friend. You don't go to your parents. You don't go to your, your children. You don't talk about anybody. Don't, don't, don't say one bad thing about that person. You go first to your brother. That's a huge step right there, isn't it? Because what do we usually do when somebody upsets us? Usually we vent, right? We go to somebody else and we vent about how upset we are about that person. But Jesus says, go first to that person. Now, this is difficult, right? Because first of all, going to that person is going to, to, to mean some intimacy there. It's going to be exposing, like, I was embarrassed by what you were doing there. Or whatever you said, that really hurt me. What you did hurt me. And then it breaks down this tendency that we have to vent and also to um, just kind of like ruminate on things and, and, and get angrier and angrier and angrier and separate ourselves and then play the silent treatment and, you know, do all these uh, passive aggressive things. Jesus says, don't do any of that. Go to your brother. The other reason it's difficult is because you might be wrong. Right? So it's hard sometimes to go to our brother and, and to know and to hear their side of the story. So we might actually be wrong if we go and talk out the situation as opposed to talking to somebody else about the situation. So it is very hard. But this is the cool thing, the beautiful thing at the very end. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am present among them. So if you go to your brother, you're one, your brother's two, you come together, who's with you? Jesus, right? He's present with you in the midst. And so that would be my encouragement is, first of all, to realize that when you have to confront somebody and you might be afraid to do it or anxious of doing it, realize that Jesus is there in your midst. And maybe when you even meet up with that person, say a prayer together. Say, I have something I want to talk to you. It's hard. Can we pray about it and ask God for his wisdom and guidance? Pray together and talk it out. And the wonderful thing is if we do that in love, Usually, it gets resolved if we're both able to do that in love. Doesn't always work, right? Sometimes you might come to somebody, you might say, you know, this is really a problem. And you try to correct them and they continue doing it. Now what do you do? What do we do now? We get two or three like-minded people, right? So now you begin to talk to other people and you say, hey, I've had this problem with so-and-so. Have you observed this? Have you experienced this? And then they might say, no, I haven't. And you realize, okay, this is just my problem. Or they say, yeah, I've seen that. And then, then you say, can you think of anybody else that may have seen it? And you find somebody else. And then you go and you take two or three people. Again, this is very hard. And you go to that person in love and you sit them down and you say, let's pray together and let's talk. And then the two or three of you share what's going on and you, and you hope for the conversion of that person. That usually does it. That's called an intervention, right? I've done it a few times in my life with people that I love. It's a, it's a powerful way of conversion. Sometimes it doesn't always work. So what do we do next? We go to the church. Okay, so you go to the church then. Don't come to the priest right away if you got a problem. Try to work it out first. If that doesn't work, then you come to the priest. Same thing with me. If you had a problem with myself or Father Paul, you would come to us first. Then you would gather two or three people, come to us. If that doesn't work, then you go to the bishop. Then you go to the bishop after, after those crucial steps. And what we find is that if we do it in love, and we gather together in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, conversion will happen. Something wonderful will happen. Instead of that person just becoming more and more and more of a Karen, they become more and more and more of a Karen, a good Karen. And then we hear the final line, that if that doesn't work, that's when you say, hit the road. We don't go to this the first step, right? But if we've tried all of those other steps, we can actually say, as Jesus says, treat them as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. In church terms, that would mean excommunication. So when somebody is doing so bad or so horrible, we actually do excommunicate. And they actually do it themselves because of their sin. They take themselves outside of the community or outside of the church. There are times when that's what you have to do. When you have somebody that is so toxic and, 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 and so stuck in evil that they don't want to change and they're just sucking everybody else into it, that would be when you would do that. 
So having said all that, I think it's important for us just to realize, first of all, don't be a Karen. <laughs> don't be the one that does that, that goes and asks for the manager and reams the manager out or talks behind the back of people. Be a Karen. Be a good Karen. And if it becomes a bigger problem, take two or three like-minded people, and then you might need to involve the church. But just remember, those steps are crucial. And what we'll find is sometimes we don't have the energy to take those steps. So we might say, all right, if that's a problem, that's okay. It's not really that big of a deal. But if it is a big deal, it's important that we reconcile. So I just want you to take a moment in your hearts right now and think about your life. And if there's anybody in your life right now that you may need to reconcile with or anybody that you may need to correct fraternally. And again, this is done with love and it's done with the guidance of the Holy Spirit and it's done with two or three people being gathered together in love for the salvation of that person but also for the good of the church. So I invite you to think about that person, to pray for this person at Mass and then have the courage to confront that person with fraternal charity and correction.